So this morning, we are in the book of Ezra. Now, I know most of you have probably read the book of Ezra over and over. It's probably one of your favorite books in the Bible. Um, you're going, yeah, right. I didn't even know Ezra was in the Bible. I thought that was just a really cool name for people that lived in Pennsylvania. So Ezra actually is a book in the Bible. Um, and actually, it's really kind of surprising. Um, the book of Ezra doesn't specifically, the Bible doesn't specifically tell us who wrote it. But there's pretty good agreement that through historical and teaching and stuff that, that Ezra was a scribe that not only, it was not only his hand that authored Ezra, but he, auth he, he was the one that the Holy Spirit used to write Ezra, to write Nehemiah, to write 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. And actually, 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles were originally one text, okay? And Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one text. So they began as two books divided into four books. So it's also widely believed and held that, that Ezra was... Um, He's a very anointed scribe, a very accurate historian. Um, Ezra would be very much a parallel to what Luke is in the New Testament. Even worldly scholars that don't embrace the Bible acknowledge that Luke was a very accurate and very detailed historian in the New Testament. So Ezra is considered to be a, a very accurate historian, a uh, very accurate scribe. Uh, it is even rumored that Ezra is actually the individual that compiled the books of the Old Testament into the books of the Old Testament. He, he wrote those four books, uh, is what we believe, but it's also believed that he's the one that really kind of gathered and canonized what we have now today as the Old Testament. So uh, very much through Ezra, God protected and covered his word and provided and delivered his word to us. Ezra is very much a picture of the scribes that, that protected the Word of God and even communicated the New Testament to us. Um, Ezra is a very significant figure. Um, Ezra, in the story, the book of Ezra and, and Nehemiah, but even the person Ezra himself is very instrumental being used of God to protect God's Word, to institute worship, and the building of the temple. So you have in Ezra, in the story of Ezra, and what we'll see today, is a very specific concentration on the Word of God, the worship of God, and the place of meeting. Amen? So already you can see, hey, we may be in this book of Ezra from way back when, but we're pulling things very much into the present. So Ezra, uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. And when the seventh month had come, how many know that numbers have significance in the Bible? Okay. Yeah. Seven is generally considered to represent completion. Seven is a number of completion. It is not insignificant that it's the seventh month. Uh, when the seventh month had come, when there was a season of completion, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Um, it was customary and expected in the days, in, in this time, that in Jerusalem, when there was a major feast, there were a few major feasts, celebrations, worship events, where God had said, everybody comes together is one for this celebration. And so this is one of those occasions. Verse 2. Then Yeshua, the son of Josaka, and his brethren the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, and his brother, arose and built the altar of God of Israel to offer on it burnt offerings as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And so already you've heard that word altar. So now you're not surprised and you know where we're going and why we're going. Amen? It is <clears throat> a, yet again the altar. We have Yeshua and Zerubbabel. Give you a little backstory, a little history. We're going to come right out of the gate with prophetic revelation. Um, Israel has been in exile, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, but Israel, the nation of Israel, what we would refer to today as God's people, had been in exile. They'd been in exile for 70 years. It's the Babylonian captivity, and they had, were taken out, many of them, many of them with significance and promise, they were taken out of the, the, the place of promise. And they were exiled and they were captives in a far and foreign place. Amen? So, 
they're in this place. This captivity was prophesied of, it was spoken of, it was spoken over. It was something that the prophets had prophesied for and there was a reason for it. There was a very specific reason for their captivity and in Babylon. And so this story right here, the beginning of this chapter, it, it, chapter 3, is the coming out of captivity. It is the coming out of that bondage, that captivity. They had been in a place of promise and quite honestly, as a result of disobedience, they had gone into captivity, but now the 70 years were fulfilled. God had prophesied that they would go into this captivity um, because of their disobedience, but after 70 years that God would bring them out. We see in this story the faithfulness of God to fulfill his word, the faithfulness of God to fulfill his promises, and the faithfulness of God to protect his word in his prophecies. You may recognize that word, Yeshua, or Joshua, Yeshua. You may have heard the term Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeshua HaMashiach is the Hebrew transliteration for Jesus, the Messiah. Yeshua in this story is a man, not Jesus Christ of Nazareth, but a man named Yeshua, but he is a high priest. Zerubbabel is a son. The name Zerubbabel literally means birthed out of captivity. Okay? Before we even really get into this story, I'm asking you to see, I'm asking you to see that there is a priest named Yeshua which to us in English in the New Testament would be Jesus. And that priest is leading and traveling with one born in captivity to a place of freedom, to a place of worship, to a place of the word, to an altar experience. If you think it's a coincidence that a high priest named Yeshua, a high priest named Jesus, is leading someone born in captivity to a place of freedom at the altar, you're missing it. It is not a coincidence. This is how real and how powerful and how direct this story and this teaching is. Amen? Amen. All right, we're going to try it without the coat. The coat looks really good on me, so I'm not happy about taking it off. But we're going to try it without the coat and see if the microphone works better. I would turn the microphone off, but we need it for the recording, and I believe that this word is to be recorded. So we have a high priest, Yeshua, that is traveling with Zerubbabel, one born in captivity, born in Babylon, and they are traveling together to a place of freedom for an altar experience to build and rebuild the presence, the temple, the dwelling place of God. This is literally the story that we're looking at. Verse 3. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its basis. Fear was on them because of the people in the land. They were still enemies. If, if you think that you're going to have your altar experience, if you think you're going to go to the altar and there's not going to be enemies in the land, there's not going to be pressure seeking to discourage you, it, you don't have the altar experience because your enemies have gone away. You, you have the altar experience because God is, is worthy and he alone is our source and our satisfaction. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its basis, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening burnt offerings. They also kept the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings in the number required by the ordinance of each day. They come out of captivity. They come back to the land of promise, the place that they have been called to, and they begin 
to observe the ordinances and do the things that they were called to do, the things that they had gotten away from doing. Please understand that, that these children of God, they were still God's beloved. They had been in captivity. And some would speculate while they were in captivity. I've, I've been asked, was it, was it just a test? Was it this, that, or the other? No. They were in exile because they had been disobedient. Now, there's so much, so much wealth and so much revelation in today's message. So much for us to carry with us and take with us. God is good. God is good. There are many who, who walk and believe that, that God is a punisher or, or that God would punish us. Can I tell you that God doesn't need to punish us? Okay. All that God ever needs to do if we are disobedient, if he needs to bring correction to our lives as a person or as a people, all that God needs to do is give us over to our own devices. All God ever needs to do is give us over to our own desires. God just simply, need, he, will, he will surrender, he will give us over to our selfish desires, to our carnal desires, to our nature, to our wishes, to our wants. And you say, well, I don't know, Pastor, that sounds kind of harsh. Really, because the word of God bears it out. Both in the Old Testament, the New Testament, we see where it is written multiple places in the scripture that if you persist in pursuing something, God will deliver you over to your desires. God will harden the heart. What does it mean to say that God hardens the heart? It, but listen, I, I, if I offend you with this statement, I apologize, but it doesn't make it any less true. You and I are inherently selfish and flawed. We are broken in our nature. Every one of us from the most unkind, most gracious, most ungracious, from the wickedest person that walks the face of the earth is still the recipient of God's mercy. None of us that has breath in our bodies has experienced the fullness of that which we deserve for our selfishness, our sinfulness, or our wickedness. Every one of us is a recipient of God's mercy. We receive his mercy <clears throat> to sustain us from the fullness of the effects of our brokenness to where we can reach a place of his grace, a place of his salvation. Mercy keeps us from receiving what we deserve until we receive his grace. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. You and I deserve the consequences of our selfish decisions. And in God's mercy, he allows us to experience some of the consequences, but not all of the consequences. If we experienced all of the consequences of our selfish nature, none of us would have breath in our bodies. And if we have no breath in our bodies, we can't experience the salvation, the redemption of grace. So he extends a measure of mercy to us that we may experience the fullness of his grace and his salvation. Every one of us outside of Christ is sustained by his mercy. Now God and God alone knows the perfect balance of how much mercy to extend to us to keep us with breath in our body, but not to give us so much mercy that we just ignore him. We need to suffer our consequences enough to know that we need him and that there is not sufficiency in us, but our sufficiency is found in him, but we need enough mercy that we don't expire before we come to that revelation. Good, I'm, we, we've got the right crowd this morning. Y'all are sharp. Y'all are with it. And so we are the product of God's mercy. God is sustaining his people. They have gone into exile because of their disobedience. We will read more in a moment, but I will we'll let you know they had allowed compromise in. And this is where it gets really important for us today. This is where we take the lessons 
from a couple of thousand years ago and we pull them into our present lives today. You see, they were still the children of God. They were still loved by God. So we're not talking about the people outside the church. In the church, we love to talk about the sinners and the people outside the church and the people in the world because then we don't have to focus on us. But the reality of the matter is most of this book is written to correct our behavior, not their behavior. And, and, and we like to hide in the church and shoot arrows at the people out in the world and just kind of ignore our own issues. But God has called us to examine our hearts more than their hearts. Amen? And, and, and so the children of God were in exile. They were in time out. Uh, it, it, I think time out is a really good way to put this. Okay? They were in time out. God allowed their enemies to come in and have victory over them and carry them away. God allowed them to be carried away because of the carnal desires and the selfish and sinful things that they had entered into in the land. They were pursuing idolatry in the land. They were pursuing things of the flesh. They were doing a lot of wrong things. But here's the most significant thing I believe that they did. And I believe the scripture bears it out very clearly. It's great to have theories and supposition, but it's even better when the word of God says, this is the way it was. Then we're not guessing anymore. We're not speculating anymore. We just know the truth. And what the scripture tells us, I believe very clearly, the children of God, when they were called into the land of God, were told to honor the Sabbath. And a Sabbath is a rest of seventh day on the end of the week. Or for us, it may be the first day of the week. But every seven days, there was to be a day of rest. But the Sabbath did not just apply to the week. Sabbaths applied to the year. And God very specifically told the children of God when they came into the land, every seventh year the land shall rest. Every seventh year you shall not tend your crops and you shall not prune your vines. You shall not harvest of the land. Every seventh year the land shall rest. They were in the land for 800 years approximately, but for 490 of those years they did not obey the Sabbath and allow that land to rest. You might quickly do the math if you like math. I'm not saying I do, but, but I, somebody else did the math for me and I just read it so I can tell you. 70 is the number of years that they missed in 490. In 490 years, there should have been 70 years of rest for the land. The people did not do what God said to do. They did not. So God said, well, I'll do it for you. You didn't give the, the, every seventh year you were supposed to let the land rest. It's been 490 years. You've built up a lot of debt. And so I'm just going to allow you to be carried out of the land so the land can rest for 70 years. Please know that God's purposes will be accomplished with or without you. Amen. There's something to put in your notes today. You can disobey God. But God's purposes will still be accomplished. God will find a way. He'll find a person. He'll find a man. He'll find a woman. He'll find a, a place that his purpose will be accomplished. You will not thwart the designs and the plans and the purposes of God. You may get in the way and he may move you aside or allow you to be carried off. But his purposes will be fulfilled. If God has spoken to you, come on. If you don't do it, he'll find someone that will. If you won't answer the call, if you won't obey the will of God, he'll find a way to get it done. They didn't obey God, and he allowed them to be carried away. He allowed them to be removed from the place of promise because they were not being... And, and here, okay, in many ways, their disobedience was subtle. They still loved God, but they weren't surrendered at the place that he had called them to. They were compromising. They were bringing some of the world in. They were, more than anything, depending upon their own works. You see, what does it say when you don't obey that Sabbath? What does it say when you don't let that land rest every seventh year? They were saying, God, we trust you, we worship you, but we're going to keep working to produce. 
We're concerned that if we don't work in the seventh year, that there won't be enough substance for our survival. At the end of the day, it's really about faith in God. Their failure to observe the Sabbath and let the land rest is another way of saying it's some part they were trusting in themselves and their works to provide. There are Christians today that confess that they trust God, that they believe God, that they worship God, yet they are still pursuing works of their own to fulfill even ministry purposes. And in the book of Ezra, we find out, and, and really not just in Ezra, in, in Chronicles and Daniel and so many of Jeremiah, so many other places, we find out that God says, uh-uh, not having that in my house. Because you see, this, this story, it's one thing if it was just about a group of people for a time, but this is a story about the ages. Zerubbabel, the one born out of captivity, the one born out of Babylonian captivity, Zerubbabel is in the line of David. He is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. This is about the works of God to reach the world. See my smile. If one day you find yourself in a ministry through which God intends to touch the world, wink, wink, nod, nod, if one day you find yourself in a ministry which God intends to use to change the world, he's not going to settle for carnality and compromise. Oh, I hope you heard me. He's not going to settle for carnality and compromise. And if you are determined, even in the midst of your worship, in the midst of your ministry, to try to make a name for yourself, to try to pursue earthly pleasures or carnal desires... If there is something of the world that has crept into what you are doing, if you don't let it go, you may find yourself carried away into exile. Oh, come on. Yes, I know, it just got very real and very prophetic. Can I tell you, this Babylonian captivity was not a singular overnight experience. The Babylonian captivity, there were three separate stages of them being taken to exile. We refer to it as one exile, but it was actually three exiles in one. Now, some of you will know what I mean, some of you won't, and if you don't, it's okay, glad you weren't here for it. I can't escape being mindful of the fact that in the past three years there have been three separate departures from this ministry of significance. I will also let you know that in the restoration, in the returning to the land of promise, there was not a singular return, there was three separate movements of restoration. Oh, come on somebody. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Well, yes, Lord, of course, you know I do. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you, you know. Peter, do you love me? Three times Peter denied Jesus. Three times Jesus said, Peter, here's your opportunity for restoration. Come on, somebody, y'all got to get this. Not only is there three stages of a fullness of the departure, there is three stages in the restoration. Every time there was an exile, for every exile, there was a restoration to the land of promise. And that which came back in was always better than that which went back out. Come on. You see, we are talking about repentance that leads to reformation. In reformation, it leads to revival. I, I want you to know that Israel, oh, this is... Mm. When you read commentaries and commentators, they begin to talk about this is the revival of the nation of Israel. Revival is not just for the New Testament. It's not just for the church today. God has been in the revival business since the days of old. 
This was a revival in Israel. And, and they had been through the period of the judges, and we recently read about that. Israel had been steeped in idolatry, and they had moved towards God and away from God, and towards God and away from God, and towards God and away from God, over and over. And there were cycles of idolatry, and there were cycles of carnality, and, and, and there was, was dispersion, and there was gathering, and there was all of this chaos. The commentators, the historians will tell you this story of Ezra, the writings of Ezra, it's coming about 500 BC, about 500 years before Christ Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, was birthed in Bethlehem. For 400 years, the history of the Jews is silent. So we're about 100 years from the silence. What I'm telling you is we are essentially at the end. This is the end time revival for the Jewish nation. From this moment, three exiles, three restorations, and suddenly they found themselves in a place of revival, and Israel never again fell into carnality and idolatry as they had been in the past. They were a new people with a new national identity. And there was unity and purpose in the nation as never before. They were finally positioned and poised then in a moment of time, the salvation of the world would be realized through this nation. Oh gosh, come on. I hope that you've got prophetic ears to hear what the Lord is speaking today. God's got this thing for threes, and there's been cycles of threes. And some of you may feel like you've lost something right now. Some of you may feel like the ministry has lost something right now. I'm telling you, the ministry is positioned. God says the ministry is positioned exactly where it is supposed to be for breakthrough, for revival, for the fulfillment of purposes. Glory be to God. It says in the text that they kept the feast and did all the ordinances and the things, but it mentions specifically the Feast of Tabernacles. I have been so high for two days on this word. God is so good. How many know when you need something, when you're hurting, when you need something, God brings his word and it'll transform everything in a moment. They mention that Israel returned to all of the feasts, all the ordinances, there was revival. They finally were back in the right place after, after all of the difficulties, but it specifically mentions the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, that's just a coincidence. They had to pick one and they wrote that one. I don't think so. I think they chose the Feast of Tabernacles. Why? Two reasons. One, it is literally the Feast of Booths. It celebrates a dwelling place. Oh, come on, somebody. If you've been around for this altar series, you understand the altar is a place of habitation. It's a dwelling place. It, it's literally the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. It is the dwelling place, the presence of God. It is where God dwells. We've said that the altar experience, they rebuilt the altar. The altar is a dwelling place. So they're celebrating specifically the dwelling place. It's, it's a temporary shelter. Come on, somebody. It's a temporary shelter where God's presence dwells. Yeah, you got it. Hallelujah, you got it. Not only that, the Feast of Tabernacles, of all of the festivals that they celebrated, of all the feasts that they honored, None had more of a celebration of joy than this. This is a celebration of joy. They specifically, the scripture tells us, at this season of restoration, after the three exiles, there's now three, three purifications, there's three rebuildings, and there is great joy. And there is a feast and a celebration of joy because the land has been cleaned and cleared. There is purification, and that purification Hallelujah, yes. You see, there is repentance, there is reformation, and repentance and reformation lead to revival. The process of restoration requires the process of purification. That's what was happening in the exile. God was purifying the land for the reformation of the people. He was purifying the people for reformation that produced revival. You don't have revival without repentance. But when you have repentance, 
You have reformation. And when you have reformation of hearts and lives and attitudes, you have a revival. And a revival that doesn't just touch a group, it sweeps through. The whole world was affected by what happened out of this season. And there was the Feast of Tabernacles. There was a dwelling presence of God in temporary shelters. And there was great joy. Oh, and they offered daily burnt offerings. You know what a burnt offering was? There's such a theme in this. It's just, it's so in your face. It's so direct. A burnt offering, and, and I apologize for the roughness of this, but it is the realness of what it is. A burnt offering, they, they skinned the offering. They took the skin off of the animal, and then they put the animal on the fire until it was burnt, completely consumed by the fire. Why on earth would they do that? Well, they gave the skins to the priest. Why on earth would they do that? Well, if you roll back to the beginning of the book, we find Adam and Eve in the garden. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they needed a covering. And God skinned an animal and took the hide, the skin of that animal, and that represents the covering, the grace of God. Hear me now. The burnt offering, the only thing that was kept was the skin that represents the grace of God. Everything else was totally consumed by fire. The works that you and I do are represented by the animal. And the works that God does is represented by the skin. Everything that you and I do outside the grace of God has no significance. It is just burn up. It means nothing. It is the work of God. And it is that that grace that is represented by the skin. He did all the work, but in the grace of God, in that covering, everything that we do matters. Hear me, please. Outside of the skin, outside of the grace of God, nothing we do matters. In under the grace of God, everything we do matters. Yeah, it's still Ezra. I just want to make sure we were still in the Old Testament because it sounds a lot like the New Testament. They kept the Feast of Tabernacles as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings and the number required by ordinance for each day. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offerings and those for new moons and for all the appointed feasts. Notice I say, it says, all the appointed feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and those of everyone who willingly offered a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord although the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. They also gave money to the masons and carpenters and food and drink and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to permission which they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Cyrus was not specifically a Jewish Christian hero. Cyrus was a king in the land. Throughout this restoration process, in the scripture in so many other places bears witness, it is God who directs the course and the hearts of men and women, even those outside of Christ to accomplish his purposes. God used Cyrus to accomplish his purposes and to accomplish the restoration. If you want to know how important repentance, restoration, and revival are to God, know that he uses people inside the church and outside the church to accomplish his purposes. There are Cyruses in the land today that God will use to bring about his end time revival. And there are men and women. But purification is a part of this process. God allowed them, gave them over to their desires. He allowed them to be carried away into captivity to accomplish the purification of that which remained and that which was taken away. 
You see, there was a remnant. Not everyone was carried out of the land into captivity. But the ones who were carried away into captivity were those who seemed to have promise. But there was always a remnant. Come on, somebody. There was always a remnant in the land. They needed a temple. And you see, the first temple was built, was built by Solomon, and they called it Solomon's Temple. This second temple that was built, the foundation, which we're beginning to discuss, it's not attributed to a monarch. It's not attributed to a king. The first temple was attributed to a man, Solomon. The second temple was attributed to the people. It was the people of God that were used of God to build the second temple. He brought wealth and provision through the people of God, through the people who were outside of their community. Cyrus literally returned gold and silver and authorized lumber to be brought. When God is in it, come on somebody, when God is in it, he will literally move heaven and earth to see his purposes accomplished. Now in, <laughs> now in the second month, in case you think God doesn't do a work quickly, now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, Joshua, the son of Jadok, and the rest of their brethren, the priests and Levites, and all those who had come out of the captivity of Jerusalem, they began to work and they appointed the Levites from 20 years old They appointed the priestly ones from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. That's nah, probably just a coincidence. Um, so they began and appointed the Levites. The Levites are the, the priest. They appointed the Levites, the priestly ones, from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Still waiting for y'all to, yeah, it's kind of, okay. Then Yeshua with his sons and brothers, Kadmiel and his sons and the sons of Judah, they arose as a bunch of different people with a whole lot of different ideas. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. They arose as one. There was a bunch of 20-somethings running around doing the priestly work of the house of the Lord, and they were as one overseeing the working of the house of God. And the sons of Hinnadad were their sons and the brethren of the Levites. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, God always lays a foundation for his work. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, the king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever towards Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Repentance that led to reformation, reformation that led to revival. Notice, notice the central actions of the story that produces the process of repentance, reformation, and revival. There is the building of an altar there is unification as one. There is a purification, a removing of idolatry and carnality. There is a coming together, a oneness. There is an altar experience. There is work in the house of God. There is a habitation, a presence of God. There is an emphasis on the word of God and it all leads to worship. The reformation, the restoration, the revival is about worship. 
They celebrated with joy. They celebrated with the presence of God. They shouted. They worshiped. They praised. Amen.